Hey, how y'all doing today? Everybody doing good? Okay. This is a participation sport here, all right? Everybody doing good today? Come on. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, my name is Clint. My wife and I get to lead Oasis Church together just around the corner, and our church service started one minute ago, and I'm not there, so... Hope it goes well, all right? It's going to go great. Uh, but uh, thanks for having me today. I'm so honored. Uh, Pastor Jason, Stacy, they're such good friends of ours. Uh, our church actually started during COVID. Um, if you want to start a church, don't do it during COVID, all right? Uh, it was the worst. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, but uh, it was great. Uh, we, but when we needed a place to meet, no one would let us meet there. And so uh, I didn't know Jason. Jason didn't know me. He saw an ad for our church come across his Facebook, and the Lord moved in his heart. He had just started working here earlier that year um, and sent me a message on Facebook that said, hey, I want to offer our facility to your church for free to meet on Sunday nights. If that's something you're interested in, let me know. And I showed up at that church, at this church, immediately after receiving that Facebook message Got to meet Pastor Jason and uh, your church. Let us meet in this building for a full year. Didn't charge us a dime. And uh, our church would have died had it not been for the generosity of you, Pastor Jason, the whole team here. And so when I walk in this room, I feel like I'm standing in a miracle because this was a miracle to us. And uh, anyway, I, I think that I could talk the whole time, but I got I got to preach a message. Um, how many people in here have ever been on a health journey before? You've been trying to lose some weight. Come on, not enough people are raising your hand. Okay, how many people have been on a health journey before? You've started something. You're like, I got to drop some weight. Uh, that was me. Uh, I lost about 50 pounds this year so far. Uh, hold on. Thank you. Uh, then I went on a cruise with just me and my wife. And what turned into a cheat week has turned into a cheat quarter. Uh, and so I got, and we just got back from vacation yesterday. And so now I'm like, I'm a piece of garbage. I have to start eating right again. But if you've ever tried to lose weight before, uh, you know how incredibly hard it is. And the reason it's hard is because everything that you want is stuff that you can't have. You know, like, you can't have dairy. You can't have, uh, you know, potatoes. I can't eat bread. Jesus is the bread of life. (laughs) You got to have bread. But I want all of those things. I love pizza. I love love anything, really. I'll eat anything. But I'll try anything one time. But I I love food. I particularly love food that's bad for me. But how many of y'all know... You need the food that you don't want because the stuff you don't want has got stuff that you need. You know what I'm saying? Like, I I don't like cauliflower. It it tastes like a toot, you know, but I I know I need vegetables. And so I got to just put my big boy pants on. I got to eat the stuff I don't like because the stuff I don't like has the stuff that I need. Y'all know what I'm saying? Today, we're going to talk about a topic of a place that hopefully no one in here likes, but that place has something that we all need. And so today, we're going to feast on it today. We're going to learn from a place that we don't like, but we all need something this place has to offer. That's why today's message is titled, What Hell Has That We Need. What Hell Has That We Need. And you're like, Jason done brought in a heretic. Hell got nothing that I need. It does. Stick with me. I'm not a heretic, I promise. You're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. All right, so we're going to look at a story today that's found in the book of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 16. And I say that this is a story because a lot of, or some people might think this is a parable, but this is an actual story. Jesus uses names. He he treats this story differently. And so most Bible scholars actually believe that this is a true story, that this actually happened. This is not like the parable of the wise man that built his house on the rock and the foolish man that built it on the sand. Like this is a real story with real people, real places. And so we're going to look at this very, very real story, and we're going to look and see what we can learn from it today. And so um, if you have your real Bible, let me see your hand real quick. Come on. Oh, there we go. For those of you that are not, turn your Bible on, on your phone, or we got on the screen, you can follow along. But we're going to read this story together, starting in verse 19. It says this, Jesus said, 
there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus. Y'all say Lazarus. Lazarus is not the same guy that Jesus rose from the dead. This is a different guy. Okay? At his gate lay the poor man Lazarus who was covered in sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Now, if you look at that in the original Greek, here's what it means. That's gross. Okay? It's gross. And so I want you to get this picture in your mind. You have Lazarus. Who's the poor man? He's got open sores. He's got something that's wrong with him. He's begging for scraps from the table, which, by the way, here's what that means. Like, this is for real. Uh, Back then, when you would eat, you'd eat with your hands, and your hands would get dirty. And so what they would do is they would pass a loaf of, like, discarded bread around, and you would wipe your hands off on this piece of bread like a towel, and it would soak up all the grease and the sauce and all that stuff, and they would throw those scraps out to not be eaten. That's what Lazarus is waiting on at the edge of the city gates, by the way. That stuff. That's nasty. That might be where COVID started right there. I don't know. But we we have, he's waiting for this. And so you have this this, uh, poor man named Lazarus. He's in the same proximity as the, the rich man, but he's living a completely different life. He's just out of reach from the rich man and everything the rich man wants. Jesus is painting this picture. It goes on to say, Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried. And he went to the place of the dead. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham! Had many sons, come on, y'all know it. Had many sons, had Father Abraham. There we go, okay. All right. Let's just praise the Lord. Okay, all right. We got some church folk up in this house. Where was I? What am I teaching on? All right, here we go. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over. He still thinks Lazarus is working for him. Send Lazarus over here. Dip and have him dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames. The tables have now turned. Now Lazarus is in heaven. He's in a place of paradise. He has no more needs. Now the rich man, he's in proximity. He can see where Lazarus is with Abraham, but he can't get there. He can't get to where Lazarus is, where Abraham is. Notice it also says, Father Abraham. Father Abraham. Now that would mean that the rich man knew about Abraham. He was actually a descendant of Abraham. He was a Jewish person. He grew up hearing about Abraham, hearing about Moses, hearing about God, hearing the word of God, hearing the law, hearing the rules. He was a person that was in close proximity to religious things. Yet he still ended up in hell. It sounds an awful lot like the South. We hear about God all the time. You're probably not going to find an unreached people group in Sumner County. They've heard of Jesus. They're in proximity of the things of God. They might even be in this room. They might come to church on Christmas and Easter. They might occasionally attend or they might serve or give. But I wonder what would happen if they died. They're associated with the things of God. But have they chosen to follow Jesus, to give their lives to Jesus? The story continues on. He says, hey, dip your finger. I'm hot. I need a little water. Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted. And Lazarus had nothing. So now he's here being comforted and you are in anguish. I want you to understand something today. I don't care who you are. Rich, poor, middle class, Republican, Democrat, man, woman. I don't care what your orientation is. I don't care what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter 
every single one of us has one thing in common. We're all going to die, and we're all going to be faced with the reality of Jesus at some point. How you live on earth does not matter. Rich man had it all. Poor man had nothing. They still both died, and they went somewhere after they died. He said, you're now in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want them I want him to warn them so they don't end up in the, this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned him. Your brothers can read what they wrote. That's a decision they have to make, right? The rich man replied, no, 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 Father Abraham, but, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they'll repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Man, what you do with Jesus while you're on earth is important. What a sobering story. What a story for us to go, whoa, like this is real. This is serious stuff. Yeah, it is. We see a man who had it all. He had the clothes, the house, the convertible camel, the, the sandals, the, the woman or women. I don't know. He, he had everything. And he dies and he goes to hell. And this man that had nothing dies and he's spending eternity in the presence of God. So let's look and see what we can learn today, okay? What does hell have that we need? There's a lot of lessons we can learn from, learn from the rich man today. The first thing is this. Hell has a reality that we need. I want you all to write that down, all right? The Bible says if you take notes, you can go to heaven. I think. I'm joking. It does not say that. It does not say that. But take notes, all right? Hell has a reality that we need. It says, and he went to the place of the dead, talking about the rich man. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. Sometimes reality hits us hard, right? Has anyone ever been hit by reality before, like a freight train? Any Vandy fans in the house? Come on. <laughs> Last week, baby. Any Alabama fans in the house? Reality hits you like a freight train. I know for me, uh, one of the times reality hit me the hardest was the day I got engaged. Here's a picture of that moment happening. Not the reality, but of us getting engaged. Look at my beautiful wife right there. And uh, man, I got to get back on that diet. I got to do that. Uh, but, but I remember this day. It was, it was amazing. Um, my wife was going with some of her girlfriends down or over to Chattanooga and spend a couple days or spend a night and a day. Or I don't remember, something. And this was the point in our relationship where we were dating and she knew that I was going to propose, but didn't know when. So every, like, holiday, birthday was ruined because it was like, is today going to be the day? And then I wouldn't do it, and she'd be mad, you know. And so I, she made me promise her, if when I go to Chattanooga, do not promise me you're not going to propose so that I can enjoy myself, and I'm not just waiting around every corner to see if you're going to propose. And I said, I promise, I won't do that. She gets out of the car. I call my best friend at the time and say, hey, I'm proposing in Chattanooga tomorrow. I need you to come with me, right? I'm starting the whole relationship off with a lie. But it's worth it, right? Some, some lies are good, you know? So we end up, uh, end up waiting in hours in the rain for her friend to finally bring her by. Her friend brings her by where I propose. I get on one knee. Literally, all I said was, I know I promised I wouldn't do this, but will you marry me? And she, of course, said yes. And we went down by the river. We had an awesome lunch. I got a ribeye, you know, and I'm like celebrating. And we get in the car, and now she and I are going home. And we're driving back to Hendersonville. And in the car, you know how this was whenever you still had to pay like five cents for every text message. So we're still call we're calling all of our friends all of our family, and like, oh my gosh, he proposed, and she's telling the story over and over again, and we're just so happy, we call grandparents, you know, and everything, we're, everybody, we're, we're celebrating, and we're calling everybody, and somewhere, you know, between Chattanooga and Nashville, 
it was honestly, I think, you know, where 24 goes over like the water and you can see like, it's beautiful. It's like uh, coming toward Nashville. It was right there. I start white knuckling the steering wheel. And what was happening was reality was hitting me. And I started to have a panic attack. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking and I start spiraling. You know how you just, when you get in that zone, you just start panicking and you're like, oh no. And Stephanie looks over and realizes that I'm not smiling. I'm literally just going. And she goes, do you want this back? Like what's, what's happening? And I was like, no, 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 I, I, I don't regret this. And I, I had one thought just circling in my head over and over again. You know what I was thinking at the time? We don't have any furniture. And I'm sitting there thinking like, how am I going to afford furniture? I, I need a recliner now, I think. And I got to get like, I, we're married and I, 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 don't have, I have to have a job. And like, I'm like, you know, freaking out. Reality was starting to set in about furniture. It was not even about like, oh no, I'm like, I'm responsible for this family now. And like, it was nothing like that. It was furniture. You know what? The very first piece of furniture we've ever bought as a family happened about four months ago. Every, we've been given furniture ever since then. God had let us have all the furniture we could want, which is awesome. So like I, reality hit me hard, you know, like I, I was just, I was nervous. Did you know hell has the same sort of reality? There are no atheists in hell. There, there's no agnostics in hell. Why? Because they've been met with the reality that this is real. God is real. I wonder how many of us are living like hell is not a real place. Did you know that your neighbor, sweet little neighbor that brings you cookies and she's old and she's as sweet as can be, loves your kids, if she doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, she's going to hell. We need that reality check sometimes. Like hell is a real place. We have to have the reality that hell is a real place. Real people go there every day. Hell is real. People are going there right now. Did you know Pew Research found that 48% of adults don't believe in hell or they just don't know? Let me just settle this today. Hell is real. It's a real place. Jesus talks about it. And it's a place where you are separated from God. People, when they die without a relationship with Jesus, not only are they missing out on the Holy Spirit and the presence of God right now in their everyday life, but they're going to spend eternity separated from God in a real place called hell. We need to start living like hell is a real place. It's real. William Booth actually said this. He's the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, if I were God... I would send every Christian to spend 15 seconds in hell. Then we would be on the doorsteps pleading with people to be saved. So what does hell have that we need? A reality. Like, hey, this is real and it matters. Some of us need a little reality check today. Hell is real. And people that don't know Jesus are going there. The second thing that hell has that we need is hell has a desperation that we need. A desperation. Rich man, he shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here with a drop of water on his finger. I'm, I'm, it's hot. I'm thirsty. Have you ever been thirsty before? Come on, you ever been like parched, middle of the night? I'm talking cotton mouth, parched. You know what I'm saying? How many of y'all have kids, little kids? Maybe yours are like mine. Mine, well, we have to make them go outside sometimes. Like, get out of my house. Go play. But, Dad, it's hot. It's 72 degrees. I'm like, hot? Hot? What? They'll go outside. 90 seconds later, I, I haven't even had time to, like, realize that they're out of the house. 90 seconds later, they come in like they've run a marathon. <gasps> they've been outside 90 seconds, and they go get a glass of water, and they'll... like they've never had water before in their life. You know, that's how they, they come in so thirsty. It gives a whole new meaning to this verse. As my children pant for water, so my soul longs for you. I think it's what the Bible should say. 
They, they, they just, they, they've, they're desperate for water. Y'all know what I'm saying? Like, their de- desperation will make you do some crazy things, right? Everyone has been desperate to some degree, right? Like, uh, do you remember when COVID was going on? Two weeks to flatten the curve. You remember this? It's a year later, like, what? Flatten, what curve are we, like, what is happening? We were going crazy. Like, Tiger King was done. Love is blind, done. We're all watching stuff and sports happening. I mean, we were, doing, we were scraping the bottom of the entertainment barrel. And at some point, we were like, gosh, will this ever end? I will do whatever it takes. I'll put a mask on. I'll get the whatever. Like, how can I get out of my house and go be normal again? Right? Like, I remember we were so desperate. Have you ever been desperate for, like, a vacation? Come on. Let me hear somebody. Everyone been desperate for a vacation? Let me just tell you, if you take your children with you, it is not a vacation. It is a relocation. Has anyone ever been desperate for a relocation to end? Y'all know what I'm saying. Lord, get me home. I'm, I'm ready to get back. Right? Like, we've all been desperate. Some of us, man, we're desperate for payday. We're desperate for the bonus. Man, we're desperate for our marriage to be better. I'm desperate for my kids to come to know Jesus because they're not living like they should. Desperation will cause you to do some crazy things. It's a powerful thing. There's a guy named Aaron Rolston. You may have heard of him before. Uh, Here's a picture of him right here. He's a mountain climber, and he was climbing by himself, which if I had to rank bad ideas, this is close to the top. Um, Climbing by himself, experienced mountain climber, this rock falls and pins his arm against the side of this cliff, that, this crevice that he's in. And he tried everything he could. He couldn't pull it out. He couldn't move the rock. His arm was stuck in there. And soon, hours went by. Those hours turned into days. He has to drink all of his food, ate all of his, or drank all of his food, Lord. <laughs> drank all of his water, ate all of his food. And he spent hours and hours and hours, and all of a sudden, desperation started to grow. Desperation's a powerful thing. And he finally realized, if I'm going to make it, I'm going to need to do something drastic. So he found his pocket knife, and he opened his pocket knife, and he started to cut through his arm. He was passing out in between moments of this, he made it down to the bone, realized that the knife couldn't get through his bone. And so he had to break his arm, continue to cut through his muscle, tendons, skin, and made it through the other side. And he cut through his arm, climbed out of the crevice with one hand, walked miles to get back to civilization, and he was saved. Now, I'm saying this story, and you're cringing, and you're like, "Uh." desperation is a powerful thing. The missing ingredient, maybe, for some of us Christians is a little desperation for God. Are you desperate for God? Like, are you willing to do whatever it takes for God? Like, to to get on your knees in the morning and say, God, I need you today. I have to have you today. If I don't have you today, I'm not going to make it. I need you working in me today, God. I'm desperate. God, my marriage needs you today. We're desperate for you to do a move in our marriage. God, I'm desperate for my kids to just come to know you. There's no pain like kid pain. Have you been desperate enough to just do whatever it takes with the Lord and say, God, I I need it. God, I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate. I'll do whatever it takes. Desperation. It's a powerful thing. The church needs to be desperate for the things of God and the presence of God. Because we, we can't do anything on our own. This is an awesome church. Pastor Jason's an awesome pastor. But that's all you got, if that's all you got. But man, what would a church look like if we just got a little desperate? 
and said, God, this church is nothing without your presence. This church is nothing without the Holy Spirit. God, we need you. I'll tell you what would happen. Man, the revival would break out. We have to have a desperation. That rich man has some desperation in hell. He had some, he had some desperation. God, I, I just need something. We need to have that desperation. We should have that hunger and thirst for God. Hell, it has a reality that we need. It has a desperation that we need. You know what else hell has that we need? It has a passion for the lost that we need. A passion for the lost. Then the rich man said, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. He had a passion for his family, a passion for the lost. Have you ever been around somebody that's passionate? You ever been around a Disney adult? You know what I'm saying? Happy birthday, by the way. Did I hear you talking about Disney earlier? You are? I, listen, I love it. Happy birthday. What's your name? Mel. Everyone, say happy birthday to Mel. Come on. There we go. I love it. I'm sorry if that just mortified you. I should not have done that. But she's a Disney adult, she says. She just told me. Disney adults are great. I used to be a Disney adult, and now I can't afford to follow them on Instagram. I just, I love Disney. But if you're ever around a Disney adult, it doesn't take long before you're like planning a trip to Disney. They start telling you about, man, you get in the gates and you hear the music playing and everyone's so happy. And you walk into the, you know, through the gates and you look at Main Street, you look down and the castle is right there. It's just, you hear the music and you smell the sweets from the, the shop right there. I mean, the, the hot dogs at Casey's Corner is over there. I mean, you hear, you hear the music is going, and it's just the Dapper Dans are singing somewhere, and you hear a dad absolutely losing it on one of his kids because they're crying at the happiest place on earth, and he's having to work four jobs to pay for this vacation, and it's magical. And then you hear, you know, man, talk, someone talking about Space Mountain. Space Mountain's the greatest. I mean, you get in there, it's just, I, I've never laughed. I never laugh like I laugh when I'm on Space Mountain. And you hear a person talk about this, and next thing you know, you're like, I'm booking a trip now. Like, their passion rubs off on you. And you're like, I'm planning a Disney trip, baby. You know, like, you just, passion is contagious. Passion breeds more passion. But you know what doesn't work with passion? Is I can tell you about passion all day long. But you're not going to get passionate until you see me be passionate about what I'm trying to get you passionate about. Like, you need to see it. You need to see somebody love something. You know, once you see someone love something, it changes everything. Why? Because passion is not taught, it's caught. Passion is not taught, it's caught. That means if you're in here and you're serving and you're leading in this church in any way, you should be the most passionate person about Jesus and this church. Why? Because passion is caught, not taught. Like, you, what would happen if some of our churches just became, what would happen if one person was passionate about the things of God? It would spread like wildfire. Why? Because people need Jesus. They need you to love Jesus. They need you to have some passion. I'll tell you, if one person, just one person, got passionate about Jesus, there's not a, all the churches in Hendersonville combined could not contain the move of God that would happen. And it takes individuals getting passionate about Jesus individuals getting passionate about Jesus that then spreads to their small group, that then spreads to the kids ministry, that spreads to the congregation, that then that leaves the walls of the church and it spreads to their marriage, it spreads to their neighbors, it spreads to the schools, it spreads to the workplaces, it spreads like wildfire. Why? Because passion breeds more passion. And we got to work together. It's going to take center point. It's going to take Oasis. It's going to take Community Church. It's going to take Church in, at Indian Lake or Christ in Love now. CIL, it's going to take Life Church. It's going to take Long Hollow. It's going to take our churches getting passionate about the kingdom of God. I don't want to have to have people go to hell to get passionate. How about we just get passionate now? 
passionate about God, passionate about seeing life change, passionate about the next generation, passionate about baptisms, passionate about people serving, passionate about giving, passionate about loving my neighbors, passionate about going to work and being Jesus to the people in my workplace. We need to have some passion as the followers of Jesus. All right, listen, your neighbors need it. Why? Because if they die without a relationship with Jesus, they're going to hell. Passion. We need passionate people. We need passionate worshipers. They aren't just going to sit there and look like someone just murdered your dog in front of you. You're singing about the Lord. Let's show some passion. On any given Sunday, check this out. One out of four people will say yes to an invitation to church. 25%. If I gave you that odds on the lottery, who's buying a ticket? I am. I'm leaving right now. I'm going to go get me a ticket. 25% chance someone could come into this building and their life could change, their family tree could change, everything could change about them. What are we doing if we're not bringing people into that environment? Uh, also, another estimate show that 95% of Christians will die and never win one soul to Jesus. 95% of Christians are not passionate about the things of God. They don't have a reality of hell. They don't have a desperation. Because if you did, I, trust me, it would spread. When are we going to have the passion that it takes? Because I'll tell you right now, you know who is passionate about your kids? You know who is passionate about your marriage? You know who is passionate about the loss? The devil. The devil wants to destroy your kids. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your home. He wants every person to go to hell when they die. He's passionate about it too. He's seeping into entertainment. He's seeping into culture. He's seeping into social media. He's seeping into everywhere he can. But I'm telling you, if the people of God would just rise up and be passionate followers of Jesus, he can do whatever he wants because nothing can contain a move of God whenever people get passionate about Jesus. We got to have some passion. We got to have some passion. So what does hell have that we need? Man, it has a reality that we need. It's got a desperation that we need. And it's got a passion for the loss that we need. But there's one more thing that hell has. And that's you. I, we think, especially if you're not familiar with the Bible or you're not familiar with church, first of all, if you're in this room and that's you, you this literally could not be the, a better place for you to be. So glad you're here. And the rest of the message has been for the Christians. This part's for you. Lost people think that heaven is their default destination and heaven is the destination that they lose out on if they're bad. So if you ask a person, hey, do you think you're going to heaven when you die? Well, yeah, why? Well, I'm not, I haven't killed anybody. I'm not a thief. I don't lie. Like, so as long as I do enough good things, I'm going to still get to go to heaven when I die. Well, the problem is, is that heaven is not our default destination. Hell is our default destination. Why? Because we're all born sinners and sin separates us from God. And there's nothing that we can do in our own power to go from hell to heaven. The Bible says it doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter how much you serve. It doesn't matter how much you read your Bible. It doesn't matter how much you come to church. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. It doesn't matter that you're better than someone that you think is worse than you. Like that doesn't get you into heaven. There's nothing you can do to get into heaven. That's why God said or that's why Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And whoever believes in the son won't die, but they'll actually have everlasting life. God sent Jesus to live the life that was free from sin that you could never live. And he died on the cross paying the price that your sins required. That cross bridges the gap from hell to heaven. And so if we believe in Jesus, we can cross over from hell to heaven, but that's the only way. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. You have to be born again. You have to repent. That means 
the way I'm going is not working, so I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to follow Jesus. And I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to do what he says. That's what it means, and that's what we have to do to have a relationship with Jesus. So I want you to know, hell might have you now, but it doesn't have to keep you. You can make a decision today to follow Jesus. And you can have the Holy Spirit now. You can have God working in your life now. And when you get to heaven, or when you die, you get to go to heaven and spend an eternity with a God that loves you, that cares for you. But that's a decision that you have to make. I can't make it for you. Thank you so much for watching this video. It truly is an honor to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. I want to encourage you, if you want to keep up with all of the latest things going on at Center Point Church, you can subscribe to this channel. You can hit that bell for alerts so that you won't miss anything. And most importantly, if this impacted you in any way, like, I want to hear about it. We want to celebrate with you. We want to serve you. So if you go to centerpointtn.com, click on Contact Us, and we can't wait to get connected with you.